I remember a very similar dream I had once where this must have been back at uni. A bunch of us, a big bunch of the the sort of gang were heading to yeah. um the cinema and suddenly I no, I'd gotten us massively lost first. We were on the trains, and I kept getting us onto the wrong train. And then eventually, we're heading in the right direction, and I realise I don't have all of the tickets. I'm missing one. And it's you. It's actually you who says to me in the dream. <laughs> oh. Well, I think we know who won't be coming in, don't we? <laughs> Fair's fair, mate. <laughs> I don't think we need to talk about that, do we? <laughs> I think one of us is going to volunteer, aren't they? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> podcast that will soon get to the bottom of things. Oh, not like that, you daft bugger. Oh, I don't mean bugger like that. I shouldn't hope. Oh, I don't mind what people get up to, just so long as they're not ramming it down my throat. Oh, not like that. Oh, you lot are terrible. Oh, let me take me belt off and then you'll be in a stick in for a sticky situation. Ooh, ah! You what, mate? I'm still Paul Salt. They can't take that away from me. I'm an idea from the 80s. You just don't work in a modern context. It's been often <laughs> said. <laughs> They've tried, but they just sort of stood at the foot of Everest and gone, nah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, you're right, mate. Give it a miss. Today we'll be discussing, oh, yay, a comedy. Oh, yay, a British comedy. Oh, yay, a British comedy starring Danny Dyer. Fuck yes. Shove it right up my ass. Ooh, uh. <laughs> it's a pyramid scheme. <laughs> if a pyramid scheme could be a physical thing, jammed up an anus. It sure can. It is Bad Person Ray Coney's 2012 adaptation of his long-running 80s gag anathema, Run For Your Wife. John Smith loved being a taxi driver. He loved being his own boss. He loved the freedom. (laughs) The one thing he loved more was his wife. Hi, Johnny, sweetie. Hello, sweetheart. Oh, and his other wife. Hi, sweetie. From Ray Cooney's smash hit stage play. There's a bit of a misunderstanding. Comes the laugh out loud film of the year. Because it's unattributed. Danny Dyer, Neil Morrissey, Denise Van Outen, and Sarah Harding. Run for your wife. I'm going to call the police. No, no, no. In cinemas Valentine's Day. I've never lost so much in my life. I haven't come to high either, sweetheart. It's clever, isn't it? Yeah. Clever name. <laughs> oh! Shit. The film was given a right good seeing to by critics. No. Peter Bradshaw at The Guardian says, The trouser-dropping 80s stage farce finally hits the big screen with Danny Dyer to kill off any remaining British self-respect. Recent Cuban national Peter Bradshaw there. <laughs> good choice. Good choice, Peter. Good feeling about Venezuela, Peter Bradshaw. <laughs> Full smile, Peter Bradshaw. <laughs> Can't get much worse. <laughs> Peter Bradshaw. He's looking at a picture of a uh, lo- loaf of bread that costs a million dollars or uh, a picture of Danny Dyer <laughs> looking at his two wives <laughs> going, no. <laughs> it's a tough choice. I think you made the right one. Charlie Lynn at Ultra Culture oh. said it's hard to believe that the play could have warranted a nine year theatrical run in 1983. Probably not entirely in 1983. Probably spilt <laughs> over a bit. No, no, it's completely untenable that they would have a <laughs> nine year run in just one year. <laughs> How did this happen? Yeah, all right, mate. It's a, there's no one explained this to him. How? How does this happen? Do you want to go after him or nah? Just, <laughs> just let him go. This way. Uh, he continues, I guess the past really is a foreign country, one populated exclusively by toddlers. It's great to imagine the 80s as a f- generation entirely populated by toddlers. I want more cocaine. Smashed the unions <laughs> and killed, killed, a f- killed him. Well, yeah, it really does remove the agency and responsibility of a lot of truly horrendous people, doesn't it? <laughs> Irresponsible of you, not Peter Bradshaw, reviewer whose name I've forgotten. <laughs> Charlie Leonard, Ultra Culture. Charlie Lynn and Ultra Culture. Yeah. That's an 80s Ben Elton sort of vehicle, isn't it? Ultra Culture. <laughs> Ultra Culture. Get on the culture highway. <laughs> <Yeah>. Oh, right. <laughs> Fuck yeah. I'm so up to date. <clears throat> the public proved to not be that much more up for it. That's a confusing sentence. Oh. Dominic Shields at Amazon titles his one star review Totally Dire. The spell is in a Danny. Oh. It's pretty good. Classic. Pretty that good. is classic jokes, mate. <laughs> jokes, mate. Bear jokes. I tell you this, though. People fucking love Neil Morrissey. Uniformly dreadful, except for Neil Morrissey, says Chris. <laughs> only decent thing was Neil Morrissey, says Edward Kerr. Neil Morrissey is the only member of the cast who can act, insists Jonathan Shaw. Actually like Neil Morrissey's character, admits Nicola23. Neil Morrissey was just unbelievably funny, speculates Pauline Young. I like how this quickly took the form of a tabloid expose. <laughs> 
Is this is this uh, Chris? <laughs> open quotation marks. Neil Morrissey Walker. Pam. Open quotation marks. <laughs> Neil Morrissey he's, Breers. He set his profile picture on all of them. <laughs> I think Neil Morrissey is actually quite underrated. I thought he was brilliant. That was my Neil Morrissey. Did these people give their surnames or are they just relatives of Neil Morrissey? Yes. <laughs> Would ne- even relatives of Neil Morrissey admit to something like that at this stage in Neil Morrissey's life? Well done, Neil Morrissey, mate. Thanks, mum, mate. <laughs> Wow, what a turn up for the books. What an awful turn up for the books. <laughs> so just a pitch. I'm just reveling in the imag- in the Imaginarium at a tableau I've constructed in which Neil Morrissey's entire family is played by Neil Morrissey. And just like it got him this far. rubbish wigs. Doesn't even go for wigs or change of clothes <laughs> or anything. <laughs> all just Neil Morrissey. It's just the same depressing khakis that he wears in Men Behaving Badly. <laughs> he doesn't even do camera angle changes or sit in different positions or on different f- bits of furniture around the room. He's just sitting there. Just staring between his knees in the same voice, just going, thanks, mum's lovely roast dinner tonight. You're welcome, Neil. I love you. <laughs> Great. So this got sad. What's on TV? Yeah, <laughs> what's on TV? And then he just presses the sofa between his legs and goes, <laughs> men behaving badly. It's great. <laughs> he puts on the men behaving badly DVD. Oh, this is on. Brilliant. It's always on. <laughs> Everybody still loves it. It's always this. on. I'm as relevant as I ever was. Comedy watched. classic. Oh, fuck me. The film has a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. Warm that old jingle back up. <clears throat> Fuck! Cost nearly a million pounds to make, and in its opening weekend, it made six hundred pounds. Yeah. <laughs> wow. This movie's opening weekend box office wouldn't pay my rent for the month. But then again, I do live in London, so Bohemian Rhapsody's opening box office might still leave me only with enough money to have the heating in one room of the flat a week. <laughs> Bathroom next week. Can't wait. <laughs> and if by heating you mean buying a bag of chips and putting it in the centre of the room. <laughs> Gather around it, children. <laughs> Can we eat it, Daddy? No, child! Only when it's cold. And then hopefully your body will produce some sort of exothermic reaction that we can all crowd around. <laughs> we crowd around one person as they eat a chip. We fed him chip. <laughs> Poverty makes you northern. The film does feature a small number of subtle and com- completely unobtrusive cameos by comedic oh. actors. Uh, and they're all mm. from the vibrant, energetic British comedy scene. So here's a list of people for whom this is their last film. Uh, Richard Briers, Frank Thornton, Bill Pertwee, Rona Anderson, Donald Sinden, and Francis Matthews. Rest in peace. Mm. Come watch this, kids! It's a swan song. <laughs> it's an energetic, popular so- swan song. We've got the cream of the crop of British comedy. Oh, one of them's dead. Died already. We've got Bernard Cribbins. <laughs> We've always got Bernard Cribbins. Never let anyone... You know what? No matter what happens with Brexit, everyone. <clears throat> Crib- Cribsy's here. <laughs> Cribbins time. <laughs> Von Cribbenstein. <laughs> His least popular nickname yet. Oh, fuck Catches me. on, though. Just goes to show what kind of a man Bernard Cribbins really is. <laughs> in spite of starring Britain, there are no actual streamers here, but I'm delighted to get Danny Dyer on his way. And Neil Morrissey. And Neil Morrissey. And Judy Dench. <laughs> Fucking apparently. You made your bed, Dench. <laughs> now, squirm in it. So, Paul, you dick and fanny. <laughs> Aren't you fanny, trio? All right. What's one thing about Run for Your Wife that made you want to get inside Christopher Biggins' big hole? Ooh, uh. Well, it's Danny Dyer's cheeky, chatty smile, isn't it? <laughs> 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 hey, hey, hey. Hey. I'm gonna do it, Carrie. He's cheeky chappy in this. He was. Such a cheeky chap. And for good reason, which we shall get into. And now. Yeah, right now. So. We open okay. in a grossly unrealistic London where everything is brightly coloured and people look at each other sometimes. <laughs> I don't recognise this place. Not just sometimes, but sometimes. <laughs> really genuinely sometimes. Not All London right. sometimes. Alright, mate, I'm a fellow Londoner. Said no one ever. I don't believe any of it, but at any rate, Danny Dyer is a taxi driver called James Smith. That's right, and he drops off a fare at the theatre where he gives mm. some money to some buskers played by panel show favourite Barry Cryer, pop singer Cliff Richard, and convicted rapist and paedophile Rolf Harris. What an unfortunate inclusion, because Barry Cry is not even a singer. <laughs> and hold on, is that Doctor in the House star Jeffrey Davis in the queue at the theatre? I think it is! <laughs> I hope so! After that, he goes and pours some tea and, um, for some other cabbies. They're all standing around drinking out of a thermos with a Union Jack on it. Oh, fucking love he it, squishes, mate. He gets a Ginsters pasty and he squishes it into each of their hands and they... <laughs> 
They grovel over the crumbs and go on for the rest of their day. In my head, that was like the nine kings of men picking the rings from at the beginning of Lord of the Rings. They each take a piece of pasty. The nine kings of cabbies. Nine. Nine pasties were given to the taxis of men who, above all else, desire fuck something funny. Gravid pork. No, it's not pork, is it? Beef. Jenny deals. Anyway, he drops off Jenny Seagrove, star of Appointment with Death. The Cockney theme tune ends, and another one just fucking starts up Torgo style. Can't have too many. He really is a cockney. I can't <laughs> emphasize that enough. He has a bit of a misfortune, doesn't he, Paul? Yeah, he does. He sees an old woman being mugged uh, by two two of the most softly spoken muggers in the world, <laughs> and um, in this fake London. Oh, yes, I'll bro, I'll kick you in the balls. Oh! And me, he, he goes, he goes and tries to stop him. And in doing so, he gets a, an handbag full of cockney prejudice, <laughs> sound wrapped, wrapped, smashed around his head, and uh, by the old lady. <laughs> and he's down, he's down, he's out for the count. He is he's, fucking out of it. Le- Lester and Purvis Emergency Services. I don't really know Courtney rhyming slang. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> well, we cut to Denise Van Houten, who's definitely asleep in bed. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. She's uh, Richter style, lying straight on her back with her arms <laughs> above the covers, face straight upwards with her eyes open. She's had a very good night's sleep. <laughs> she knows what she's doing in this film. She wakes up, as does Sarah Harding, and they both discover their husbands didn't come Oh, home. no! I wonder how this pertains to Danny Dyer being milked out. Oh. Surely he could only be one of the people. Surely, if, if English marital law is anything to go by. Well, it should be. It bloody well should be. God save us. So, <laughs> it turns out Danny Dyer is at a hospital. They both call the police or something. Jesus yeah. Christ, it just occurred to me how awful this plot is going to be to recount. Yeah, great. Well, they, they both oh, call different me. police stations in different parts of London. Yes. It's London, everyone. It's crazy. Two different police forces. <laughs> oh. Finsbury and... Stockwell. Stockwell is correct. But Ending. Danny Dyer, meanwhile, is in hospital. Yeah. Where Nurse Gladys herself, Linda Barron, is working, Great. along with Louise Jameson, who was only in EastEnders for two years. That's right, she was only in 229 episodes. <laughs> Fuck that show. Who needs an ending? I just got the box set, it's taking up my living room. He's in there with hospital patients, Russ Abbott, Bernard Cribbins, and Shakespearean actor Nikki Henson. Fantastic. Great. Sorry, I've just thought of the box set. Uh, it, do they just pump it through your window consistently, and it's on VHS <laughs> tapes? So it's Once just a day, constant stream of VHSs. Bird. Just falling onto a pile in your horrible living room. <laughs> the reel from the FVHS goes out the window <laughs> down to a printing machine. <laughs> What's that? It's just he said this. He, he's picked up by a policeman who's definitely not menacing enough for this role. Who? <laughs> what do you mean? He's perfectly forceful. <laughs> Great. He says, oh, come on, come on, Mr. Dye, you cheeky chappy. I'm going to take you home. E- even though you are painfully annoying on sedatives, let me let me do this for you. <laughs> well, it's not painfully annoying, Paul. He's doing his great jokes. Oh, he's doing his great jokes. He's all over the place. He's on. Oh. He's had three paracetamol and a <laughs> cup of extra strong builder's tea. He's never experienced anything ever before. He's all over the gaff. He's, he's, <laughs> he's... Up the wrong end. Feeling dental, proper mental. And <laughs> they drive him home, and it's time for that great theme tune again. Do you love it yet? Run for your wife! Run for your wife! Yeah, the, the fucking one that was commissioned especially for this film, I imagine. <laughs> Good for them. Yeah, because the fucking stage show opens with love and marriage. So they made this for the film. That's clever. Don't worry. It was a 2012 original. Brilliant. Wow. Wow, everyone. And so, yeah, and he, he gets home and his wife, Denise Van Houten's there. And yes. she's, oh. Uh, yes, yes, it is Denise Van Houten. They arrive home to the ugliest flat in London. Bright yellow, the walls. Sarah Harding doesn't have her husband home. She's very worried because her husband might be on, in hospital on one of those vibrators. Pause for laughter. Pause for laughter and for both nurses to hang a fucking lampshade on it. Two lampshades <laughs> are hung on this joke. Oh, we're going to need more lampshades for the fucking jokes in this film. Never mind, I'll get a lovely musical sting to denote whenever a joke is told in this film. Excuse me? <laughs> uh, it's all right, go back downstairs, we're dealing with this. Yeah, who the bloody hell are you anyway? We're on the flat downstairs. And what the bloody hell does she mean by we? Fantastic, I look forward to that, Paul. Yeah. You could sample it every after every one of our jokes. <laughs> I tell you, I tell you, I hope there are, hope there are more jokes in our episode. <laughs> <laughs> I've used it once so far. So, and fucking, how much of this can we just summarise? He's got two wives. 
And he tries for them not to find out he's got two drives. We spend the next 30 minutes in a flat. We do. He tries to explain to Neil Morrissey how this happened. Uh, and the director briefly thinks, should we have this flashback in black and white? Nah, fuck it. Punt- punters won't tolerate it. So he fades the colour immediately. There's two reporters who show up. They're called Dick and Fanny. Do you fucking get it yet? Nope. Couple more times. Right, you are, Gov. Hi, Dick. (laughs) Hi, Fanny. Hi, Fanny. Hi, Dick. Bong. Better put the sting in. Neil Morrissey, against all sort of character development so far, is the voice of reason here, saying, Danny Dyer, you're proper out of order, mate. Danny Dyer's like, don't you do a fasten on me, you fucking treacle, blah, blah, blah. I'm (laughs) allowed to do a hate crime. Yeah. (laughs) Tell you what, Neil Morrissey, you're frying lorry. You're in the back of a lorry. (laughs) On this one, I mate, like the idea which... that you've changed up your tactic to coming up with the word first and then thinking of what it means <laughs> in context. Other one wasn't working. Neither <laughs> like is the are. other one. It's good. It's good to know. I can just, just go to do what feels right now. You are W. H. Smith, mate. You're <laughs> <laughs> Ken and Kiff. F- full of full of piff. Well, who's taking the piss? It's only the copper because he's found out that Danny Dyer has two home addresses and decides to make it his life's fucking work to tear him down as a result. It, this is he's his probably, movie dick. He's probably a drug mule or at the very least a racist <laughs> cockney type. And He's doing a bit of the old Moby dick. He's, ha- he's having a sick. <laughs> oh, now what? Danny Dyer, he's got to get down to um, Stockwell, back to his other to... wife, Sarah Harding. Oh, and he's climbing out the bloody window. Oh, no I'll... way. You know what? I laugh, but I shouldn't really because he's had oh. hell of a time already. He has. No, he's, he's naughty. He's a naughty man, but he shouldn't be running around like that. He'll do himself another injury at this rate. He's, you know what? He's a fool to himself more than anyone else. That's all I'll say. Oh, he stepped on a rake! Love it. He's an April fool. Is fool. <laughs> Neil Morris is um, lightening the, the tone by telling everyone in, in Stockwell that Denise Van Houten has a sexually transmitted disease, probably like gonorrhea. <laughs> But never mind, because Danny Dyer's got to get over to Finsbury to, um, before his other wife's midriff freezes and falls off. Oh, fuck me. And yeah. he gets, he's on his way to Stockwell. Bloody funny gets said three times in incredibly unfunny scenarios, one of which involves yeah. Man About the House star Brian Murph- Murphy. That was bloody funny. <laughs> that was bloody funny. <laughs> I suppose you think that was bloody funny. He gets in a taxi and there's an animated map sequence that is miraculously bereft of any attempt at humour. And he finds his wife in a fucking exercise class with June Whitfield, Maureen Lippman, Lisa Goddard and Gene Ferguson off Corrie. Great. It's really got everyone, Paul. It's quite, <laughs> it's quite a spectacle. It's that year's Black Panther. <laughs> Best picture. And um, he gets there. He eats the newspaper that has already printed the picture of him with his other wife. Yeah. Um, Christopher Biggins is there. He's gay and it's very funny. She'll be at the sports centre taking the old dears through their paces. Knees bent, touch your toes, wobble your boobies. <laughs> We're in the dressmaking business. <laughs> Trouble is, Cyril can't bear to part with half of them. <laughs> He, he's, he's an Ola gay gay and then another policeman from fucking Finsbury turns up oh god they end up at the Finsbury flat um, Danny Dyer and Neil Morrissey yeah he comes well reasons. Neil Morrissey comes over to Stockwell on the bus getting off the bus with Sylvia Sims star of Ice Cold and Alex whom I once met and she's lovely um, oh, surely... I suppose you think this is bloody funny she says probably, <laughs> probably fuck me I suppose you think this film is hilarious <laughs> she win an Oscar or something it's probably what you think <laughs> it's a Sylvia Sims lovely person bong um, there's a newspaper stealing sequence which involves Richard Bryars Simon Williams Andrew Sachs and Jim Carver himself Mark Wingett mm, all saying I suppose you think this is bloody hilarious <laughs> best film of the year <laughs> I fucking hate all of them. I hope they're all dead. Um, yep. Some of them are. Now, yeah, they have, <laughs> well, there you go. they have a whole thing with the, the, the upstairs flat is leaking to no effect. So when the definitely menacing enough police officer comes in and confronts Danny Dyer and Neil Morrissey, that's going on. And they... Danny Dyer says, oh, come, all right, I've got to admit, I've got to come clean because you finally you've pushed me. I'm I'm Jack Hornet here. I'm in a corner and <laughs> I'm well and truly mullered. I'll come. I'll come Michael Sheen with you right now. <laughs> I'm gay, and Neil Morrissey is also. It's very funny. And they go, oh, you're gay! You you like other men! <laughs> you! A man! I'm a bit of the West End play. Gay. <laughs> At some stage, fucking Denise Van Houten gets wind of this over the phone, and she decides she's going to drive over, and the film's like... She's never heard a more disgusting thing in her life. No, she's fucking revolted and repulsed all the way through. All the way down to her midriff. Yeah, at this stage, the director's like, oh, fuck, I've got so many cameos left to fit in. You know what? A fucking bus of them just shows up. And blocks Denise Van Houten on the road. 
It's Robin, uh, As- uh. <laughs> Robin Asquith driving with Tony Britton, Fern's dad, William Gaunt, Ter- Darren Nesbitt, Bill Pertwee, Donald Sinden, Frank Thornton, Wanda Ventham, and Moray Watson. Fan-fucking-tastic. God, what a cinematic treat. You know, Ray Cooney asked us to be in this film, and we didn't really want to, but he's such a lovely man. <laughs> they have no idea where this bus is going. <laughs> Are we at Seaside yet? <laughs> he just said, that actual Pim's party... <laughs> and uh, we're like, well, we're old, so we des- we deserve it. And, you know, there's a recession on. <laughs> so we're voting to leave the EU. Anyway, it all gets wrapped up. But you're up. black and blue, leave the EU. <laughs> we're getting rid of blue as well. There's no black in the Union Jack <laughs> and no blue now. We've decided to properly fuck it. It's just red and white. <laughs> it's red and white like Poland. <laughs> That's what we need to be. Um... More like Poland, says old people in the UK. <laughs> So it gets resolved, doesn't it? Somehow he still ends up with two wives at the end. It doesn't really get resolved, and that's the great ending because he. <laughs> it's after they get over the fact that that they're gay and it, like the outrage has died down. He then says, "All right, I've got to come clean. I've got to come, Bill McLean. Who's Bill McLean? <laughs> totally clean about this. That woman over there, who 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 could be? She's a transvestite. Yeah, let's get <laughs> oh, them shaming you, in it. What? What? It's first you're gay and then there's a transvestite. This one's got everything. I don't believe any of it. It's outrageous. And then <laughs> and after after that, they totally believe him. He didn't have to come clean. And that fucking Tony Morrissey has been fucking everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Even the policeman. <laughs> Absolutely all of them. And that's it. And both of them are pregnant. And now he's got a, he's got two kids on the way. Oh no. He, he's gonna be bloody fizzy double busy <laughs> he's a cockney chappy and he's got two kids from two women two kids dun, 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 bam, bam. he committed bigamy but that's all right come on and down to the pub i got two kids <laughs> fucking hell wait for the sequel run for your two kids fuck me here are some cameos i didn't notice apparently there's a scene in the pub I didn't notice a scene in a pub, but it had Pranilla Scales, Conservative MP Giles Watling, and Coronation Street's Timothy West. Brilliant. Fantastic. Also a scene in a shop I didn't notice, which had Sue Pollard, Jeff Leach, and Noel Edmonds. And what? then just randomly assorted, Jess Conrad as piano player, Tommy Conti as actor, Wendy Craig as nanny, Ian Cullen as wrinkled man, Pamela Cundell as war widow, Judy Dench as bag lady, Les Dennis as man on street, Derek Folds as man in hat... You won't forget that. Vernon mm. Kay as plate spinning man. What the fuck was that? These, are, these Mi- all must be cut. They must be. Vicky Mitchell as tourist. Pat Sharp as man in flat. Presumably not the deeply intimidating one who comes to the door near the end of the film. <laughs> He's changed. Ma- <laughs> he has changed since the 80s. I'm with Pat Sharp. It was 80s cocaine and 90s pies really took a turn on him. <laughs> and Yeah, it really got in there into his soul. Marcia Warren as woman on seat. Unforgettable role there. Dennis Waterman as minding person. Oh, I get it. Very clever. And comedy comedy legend Jeffrey Palmer as man on toilet. These must have been cut. I don't remember any of this shit. Fuck me. I hope all of these people substitute for gags. (laughs) So what do you think of it, Paul? Ah, it's it's really bad. Yeah, it really was. (laughs) It was really bad, outdated, unfunny, (sighs) and uncharming in pretty much every way. Yeah. Thanks for listening, everyone. Yeah, um, yeah it, I'd say here's the best thing about this. It's great that I can now answer anyone who asks me, so what kind of comedy is it you don't like? <laughs> uh, it's this. <laughs> calm down, Just calm down. I'm going to kill the pair of you. It's, it's, it's just a bit of a misunderstanding. Let's have it. Let's bloody have it. This is everything I hate about comedy movies, and unfortunately, the stuff I hate is far too endemic of British comedy in particular. The goofy fucking music that's like a kid's movie, pantomime performances that are completely over the top, the garish colour palette that seems designed to arrest the attention of halfwits, innuendo that barely fucking works as a single meaning, the incessant sound effects to score every semi-humorous line. But more importantly than that, and I don't quite know how to phrase this, in in the stage show, there's a line that might have been in the film. I don't know, and I'm not fucking going back to check. Neil Morrison, that's his name in the stage show, just <laughs> says, "What you've been living in Stockwell? Oh, it's it's um Stockwell and Finsbury in the stage play. Not it's not sorry, it's not Stockwell and Finsbury in the stage play. It's Wimbledon and Streatham because they're okay. like four minutes from each other. I don't know why they felt the need to amp up the fucking stakes of the film by having it set across all of London instead of just four minutes away from each other." It just makes it more ridiculous. They, they needed to burn a fucking travelling CGI effect on it. <laughs> yeah, they needed a quick montage and a map sequence. You've been living in Streatham with your girlfriend? Yeah, only she's not exactly my girlfriend. Whoa, 
Oh, what is she then? A bloody Shetland pony? Guffaw. And that's the fucking humour of this thing, yeah. and I hate it. First, it's bollocks. Second, it's so <laughs> lacking in ambition. Imagine mm. writing that line and being happy with it. Oh, God, a Shetland pony. That's the last thing she is. Fuck off. Like, the comedy for me is, so far, it was just... <clears throat> oh, yeah. What is he like? What's he actually like? What? I don't know. What it's not told as anything. Like? Every joke was met with either... <clears throat> or, did you really just say that? He just said this. There's so many lampshades on this. Oh, the film was fucking fuck. pitch. Well, you mustn't risk them missing it. You oh, know, you mustn't no. let the audience miss a joke. They've got to notice every single fucking one. That's why we put a fucking tune in so that they can know that they're there. Do you know the difference between Dario Fo, anarchic Italian c- <laughs> comedic dramatist, and no. Ray Cooney? I'd love to know. Um, I thought you were going to say timing and cut me off like a dick. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not that clever. I'm not that clever. That's- that's a very long-winded version of that joke, mate. I like it. Timing. <laughs> it is, we don't want him in hospital hooked up to one of them vibrators. It's a very Dario Fo kind of joke, but it would be delivered completely deadpan and skimmed over and, and not even picked up on by the other characters. It's just a, a yeah. wonderful little bit of wordplay. You move on. If you laugh, then it's then you laugh. If not, then whatever. It just character helps sort of flesh out this character. Yeah. But in this, every terrible joke that... Yeah. We really definitely got, and wasn't funny the first time, was met with a sort of sideways glance of two other characters or a bong. Yeah. You know what I think it is? They're expecting a laugh track. When you're in the theatre, and this is, to be honest, the thing that this film reminds me of more than anything else is when shit old British comedies used to adapt to the big screen. Yeah. Which used to happen a lot. They used to make movies of old sitcoms. And it would be full of this awkwardness because you don't have a laugh track anymore. And a laugh track allows the audience to finish laughing at a joke because you're too insecure to risk someone not noticing the next one. Yeah. And if you watch old episodes of Dad's Army, the the laugh track is... I don't know. I assume they uh, performed to a live studio audience. But, you know, anytime anything sharp even approaches um, Jones's ass, the whole audience goes, what? <laughs> like that, like a fucking shriek of noise. Like an American comedy audience. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable, and that Jesus. allows reserve. the sort of and uh, when you take all of that out, it affects the timing. Yeah, and it leaves it feeling really fucking awkward. And so he's put in these little musical stings, or characters like looking at each other, like oh, what have we got here then? And it's just so fucking awkward. It's, it's unbearable so... to someone who didn't like the original joke. Amateurish, yeah, is the word. One subplot in this is genuinely Neil Morrissey sits on a chocolate cake and then sits on other things. Yeah, that's just part of the plot for ten minutes. <laughs> and yeah. It, it's just so basic. Do you know what one thing I really hate that represents a lot of this, and I think Sex Lives of the Potato Men had this as well, as did um, mm. Lesbian Vampire Killers, is that it feels like comedy pitched towards kids. It feels like pantomime-style mm. comedy, but it's full of really awkward and unpleasant sex jokes and innuendo. And, and consequently, it makes me feel like I'm being really condescended to, because I know it's meant mm. for me, I know it's meant for adults, but it's being delivered in this overly bright sort of, hello, mate, what you got going on then? sort of kid yeah. style and it's like oh fuck why can't you be natural why is yeah. it more funny if you're not natural why is this strange sort of hang about what's going on here then why is that more funny than you know what's going on here then like if it had been a bit more naturalistic yeah. with again with a more menacing copper who was actually a threat and <laughs> that could have that would have also been funnier because it would have created some sort of anxiety or f- some sort of free song, yeah. some sort of rippling in my loins. But he's Hodges. Just something. He's, he's meant to be like Hodges from Dad's Army. Like, oh, I'll get him now. Oh, oh you just see if I don't. Yeah. You know, and it's just, oh, this is so dated. Not... It makes my skin crawl. And like, this was filmed in 2013. I thought this was early noughties. <laughs> no. Because everything that's... about it has that awful aesthetic to it. Everyone looks awful. Yeah. Everything looks terrible. I mean, that's the thing. It's the play. We have to acknowledge this. The play ran in the 80s and was written in the 80s. And a lot's happened since then. And it's a bit hard to relate with that time with its unpopular Tory government, celebrity president in the White House, rioting and mass protests against disastrous governmental decisions, terrorist attacks in London and Noel Edmonds on the television every night. Ugh. You know, it's hard to imagine all of those things. And I, I would be more forgiving if this was 2002. 2002. <laughs> when the world was still struggling to shake off the sick, the stickly, sorry, the sticky remnants of the 20th century. But 2012, you know, it's the year, 
It's the year of the London Olympics, yeah. when Britain discovered a massively ill-deserved and misplaced sense of national pride for a month. <laughs> yeah, if nothing, if nothing else, it really brought attention to the fact that there are black people in England, and that was quite nice. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, uh, at least there's that. But look, there's a, a good demonstration of how fucking dated this all is, is that there's a far show sketch that serves as a really good parody of this film. Yeah. The one where they send up the confessions of a sex maniac mm. fucking franchise. I'm selling cucumbers. All right. I can give you one if you like. I bet you could, you randy git. It's a lovely day. Gorgeous. Oh, that looks warm and hairy. Right, so what you got then? Is it big? Enormous. I'm not talking about your cucumbers. Neither am I. Coming in. I could do with a quick one. <laughs> oh. It's that, you know, and it's old and shit. I should just point out, I haven't seen very many of those old sex comedies, and if someone who's a big fan of the old carry-on movies and confessions of wants to get back to me and say actually some of them were really good, then I should say that I actually am coming from a lack of experience here. And just saying that this comedy really doesn't fucking work at the moment. I'm sure some of those old films do work great, but I'm not going to find out because the whole idea really sickens me. <laughs> you shouldn't have two wives! Yeah. You shouldn't. And I think the original stage show, he's a bit more he- henpecked. Okay. You know, it's a bit more of a sort of Crawford, uh, Michael Crawford style character of just, um, oh, you know, she proposed and I did, I didn't want to disappoint her. You yeah. Know? Okay. But here he's just, he's just a bit of a. Uh, okay. Well, that's interesting. That makes a lot of difference. Just logically, don't you have to register to be married? And aren't you prevented from committing bigamy? <laughs> that's the thing. Is a lot of this made more sense pre-digitization. Like the bit in the, where he he's convinced everyone that he, the hospital mixed up yeah. his records. You know, there's a long bit in the stage play where he's talking about how, oh, you see, they must have yeah. gone to the previous page in their book and seen that I was in there for the different head injury. Yeah. And it's like, no, that wouldn't happen now. You'd have an NHS number and it would be diff- it'd be the same. And I'd give you away, you prick. <laughs> you total fucking prick. You total fucking prick. That's the thing. It's just this play hasn't updated at all. So it's incredulous as well as yes, not being funny. Yes, that's it. And you're doing, doing it in 2012, 2013. Mm. You, you have to. You can't. Yeah. You, you have to update it from the, the period in which it was written. And you also have to make it not a play. Yeah. Because there are completely different expectations and standards for a play. And I find when I go and see a play that it's a very fine line between being sucked into it and being very aware that I'm watching a play. So then sure. translating that to a movie... It, it just disastrous. Yeah. If, if people are sort of speaking to the back row and every, all these characters are really broad and it's this kind of farce, yeah. then uh. every, I mean, everything's set up to take place in, in apartment buildings on different levels. And you can imagine in the theatre, if you were really inventive, you could construct these different levels and have people climbing out of windows, again, much like Dario Fo. Um, well, they, they don't and- actually. What they do in the stage play is really interesting, which is that they have mm. one living room and it's mm. implied to represent both living rooms mm, so characters okay. will literally share the same space yeah but you are expected to and it does quite a good job of convincing you early on that actually these are two different living rooms and these characters are not in the same room so yeah. even though they're you know literally just two feet apart from each other one can't hear the other because one of them's in streatham and the other one's in yeah yeah wherever the fuck wimbledon so okay. it's quite inventive well, it, yeah. and clever and some of the gags work because of that and that's all lost here. Yeah, well, there we go. Whatever form it takes, it's yeah. the theatre necessitating being more inventive with the, the scenery. So they didn't need to have everything so feel so closed off. And it, yeah. it, it really made things duller. Yes. I, the, the way everything was filmed and set up with people just running up and down stairs. And it felt like, a, like they're just taking it straight from a stage show. Yeah, you've got to rewrite a script to be suitable for the movie. Yeah. Even with things like Closer, it's still really jarring. No matter the production value and the performances mm. being great, it's still quite jarring having people come on and speak in very sort of polished monologues. Yeah. So with a film like this, fucking hell. Which isn't to say that you need to have sort of lots of locations to make something feel cinematic. No. There are, ve- there are very no. many brilliantly cinematic films that are set within one location that have yeah, been adapted absolutely. from screenplays, like Sleuth and uh, Carnage was really good for that and um well what else has been what was recent there was a stage play bug the um yeah. william freakin thing and again actually with uh killer joe yeah, yeah. There's, there's been a few a few really interesting limited location places that do feel cinematic yeah. this just doesn't 44 inch chest down to oh yeah yeah that too i have to put it down to the cinematography and the script and the acting and the direction <laughs> <laughs> and the music everything everything that yeah. made up the film but look, there's one element that I, we've, we haven't quite addressed right now, and I have mm. to get onto it, which is that I don't like Danny Dyer. <laughs> yeah. It's a criminal offence. Yeah. You can go to jail. <laughs> yeah. Well, doesn't that worry you? Well, I've been too busy to think about it. 
Now I've got to get to Stephanie. There are many things I could point to for this. Mm. There's the 2012, there's the 2010 issue of Zoo, just two years yeah. prior to this, so it was still fresh in the mind. Uh, mm. For which he was Agony Uncle at the time, mm-hmm. and in which he advised a reader who was complaining that the girl he had broken up with seemed to now be doing better than him, and so he said, in his words, go out on a rampage with the boys, getting on the booze and smashing anything that moves. Then, when some bird falls for you, you can turn the tables and break her heart. Of course, the other option is to cut your ex's face, and then no mm. one will want her. Now, that yes. is the entirety of his response, and he claims that he was massively misquoted in this article that he wrote. Yes. Now, I, I think that's a bullshit excuse, and I <laughs> I would say, at, the, at my most generous, I think it's it's a little bit of irony there that was really misplaced and in very poor taste. I, I would like to give him the benefit of the doubt. I have no reason to want to give him the benefit of the doubt, just because yeah. I have no goodwill saved for him, so I have no basis to say that that, was, uh, that, that might be irony yeah. because also the other thing is and this is where i've experienced him more is that he has seemingly a complete lack of sense of humor about himself he famously mm. threatened to beat up mark Kermod after his neg- he negatively reviewed some of his films quite shittily it should be pointed out but still and he yeah. also used to make me he used to make me sort of feel very deeply uncomfortable <laughs> during his appearances on comedy panel shows in the uk which usually ended with him getting very stroppy and upset with everyone mm. it's hard to be too upset with that because it is exactly what the fucking producers wanted you know treat they yeah. treat him like a chimp oh let's have danny on he's mental He'll say something yeah. really crass and we can all laugh at him for it. So it's no wonder that he would eventually resent that treatment and break free of his chains, kidnap a woman and drag her to the top of the Empire State Building. <laughs> it was beauty that killed the Dyer. Can't you see, producers, that in the game of inviting Danny Dyer onto comedy panel shows, there are no winners. Yeah, it really doesn't feel that way. I, I feel like he's not a comedian and no. he's not particularly good at taking a joke. And it feels like no. he's making the wrong decision by going on um, comedy <laughs> panel shows. By doing this, <laughs> or appearing in comedy films, perhaps. But I've, to be, I haven't seen any of his films where he plays the sort of hard man. You know, hard man. Yeah. Oh, he's a bit of a bit of an Arden, like that Ross Kemp, <laughs> or that <like> Martin Kemp. <laughs> I haven't seen any of those, so <laughs> I don't know yeah. about how successful he was. I well, guess we'll fucking come on to it. I, I am very much looking forward to the time when we get to do Mean Machine or Football Factory. I don't know whether they've been poorly rated or not, and if so, we're going to have to do a Danny Dyer double bill pool at some point. In Paul, it. I can guarantee you they've been poorly fucking rated. Okay, great. <laughs> I seriously doubt one of these is the fucking gem of the Danny Dyer filmography. What was it? Meme Machine, the one with um, fucking Ving... Not Vinny, Ving, Vinny Jones. Vinny Jones, there you are. 34%. Great, and Football Factory, 43%. Nice. So we will get onto these at some point and make Danny Dyer a, a three-man. <laughs> what is Danny Dyer's highest rated film? I Probably Human Traffic. No, 59%. Severance, 66%. That was okay. Yeah, that was all right. Lowest rated? This? I thought Human Traffic was a good film. It certainly captured an era, a generation. I'm actually wrong, Paul. He was in four other films that were given 0%. <laughs> Ah, good. Well, he's going to be a three-man then, no doubt. And then he'll offer to beat us up like Uwe Boll would. But I, I think in, in Football Factory... Now, this is going to be one of those times where I, I get to revisit a film and, and it'll yes. completely change my opinion on it. But I don't remember Danny Dyer being a typical hard man. He was he was a geezer who was, was not able to look out for himself, really. Yeah. Was he a Ray um, Winston and, and type from Sexy Beast? That's the best ever hard man term uh... for me. That's probably a good point of comparison, actually. Yeah, okay. nice pull. And in Mean Machine, he's he's more the butt of everyone's joke, and he, he saves the day because oh, look at him, little Danny Dyer, <laughs> just wants to make everyone please, everyone, make him happy. <laughs> I just don't like him. I don't like watching ninety minutes of him. I don't find him an endearing character. And I think really for yeah. a premise like this, you've got to, got to, got to have an endearing character in that lead role because otherwise it's yeah. just a guy who's lying to two women he should be caring about and it's not helped yes. by most of the productions i saw the women are how do i phrase this diplomatically homely mm. they're not fucking page three you know that british 90s page three look with the really really shiny faces and the abs mm. that's what's going on here and it does make him it makes him more despicable in a way because it emphasizes the sexual aspect of this and the original it's just it's yeah. very much just a case of he wasn't brave enough to not have two wives. You know, he's kind of fallen <laughs> yeah. into it just like he falls into everything else. And now it's too late to That is to a totally actually be different honest. story. Yeah, it really is. Here yeah. it's just he wants he wants to have it all. You know, he wants to have his Denise Van Houten and his Sarah Harding. Yeah. And eat it too. And he does. You know. And it's he's just, like Paul Verhoeven. Yeah. And it ends with just him being a double dad, which is yeah. just a really chilling finale to this. <laughs> it's like, oh, God. Ugh. And we're meant to think, Oh no. 
does he ever get a break? Oh. I hope he eventually does of his spine. <laughs> Look, I hated this. Shall we quick fire? Yes, please. <laughs> quick fire. I have five. So if you have more than five, you'd better start. Yeah, all right. Maybe I should do two at a time. Yes, please. The conversation between the muggers and the old woman made me chuckle at the beginning when uh, one of them says, give us your bag, you silly cow. And she says, oh, watch your language, you bastard. <laughs> That's quite <laughs> obvious awesome. joke, but it made me laugh. Yeah. Especially Bond, because I gave her that Rick Mayo spin <laughs> in my voice there. Yeah. Oh, God. I quite liked it when he was very, very drugged and he was being led out of the hospital mm. and... He was stroking the guy's tie, which was, you know, obviously meant to be a sort of, oh, we don't know what he's doing sort of gag. But it was yeah. his dialogue in that moment that I quite liked. You're a nice nurse, isn't you? You're a lovely nurse, eh? Yeah. That was quite amusing. Yeah, that did make me laugh. When Denise Van Outen wakes up in the morning and goes into the kitchen and the dining area to look for Danny Dyer, the the, the, the D- Danny dining area. Oh, oh what are you um, like now? <laughs> what am I like? I'm a cheeky chappy. I'm a bigamist. <laughs> You're a toilet in the hall. <laughs> I'm I'm an overreaching joke. I'm come oh. from Stoke. It's harder than it looks. Do you know that all Cockney rhyming stamps come c- completely off the cuff by the poet? <laughs> it's amazing that it worked out as well as it did. It's incredible. Everyone knew what everyone meant all the time. It's harder than it looks. Look, Paul, fin- f- finish this one. Sunny Melbourne. Yeah, it's fucking impossible, isn't it? Sunny Melbourne, <laughs> stubborn stain. Do your next one, you grass. No, that that I haven't finished yet. Oh, okay. um, otherwise, my good thing for that was just my <laughs> joke. Um, no, they, she goes into the dine, the Danny dining area, and their, their cereal packets are on the table. Oh yeah, I saw that. Do they just leave them there, <laughs> or does she set up the table over, like the night before and puts the frosties on the <laughs> table and two bowls? He loves his frosties. Oh, if he doesn't get them, st- stabs seven people, commits bigamy. Um, the joke eventually goes on too long and it pisses me off. But initially, <laughs> Neil Morrissey said his pants in his in the in the yeah. house, and he says, "Oh yes, um, I'm about to go to." And then he looks at his own attire and realizes he's just in pants and just finishes lamely bed. <laughs> this is the only Aww. thing he can think he would be going to whilst dressed like that. But then there's a whole thing about yeah, bed, yeah, lovely, gotta get a bed, sleep. Oh, fuck off. Yeah, and and actually the whole premise of. Denise Van Houten liking angry sex after that and just fucking mm. chasing them out of the apartment, screaming and banging on the car. Mm. When imagined through the eyes of the policeman who genuinely thought that this is how she liked it, was quite funny. <laughs> okay. All right then, mate. Whatever. <laughs> I'll put the gun down. When they're in the, the hospital and some bloke, the camp one cameo, says, I've been waiting 20 minutes already. Oh, halcyon days. Yeah, only 20 minutes. I think I just like Lionel Blair. It's the opposite of oh. Danny Dyer. He's appeared on a number of panel shows where he's been quite erudite and funny and, mm. you know, fairly well-mannered. So even though in this his role is mostly just crying, I still mm. I still kind of like him. Oh, it's erudite Blair. I like the line, I think it's from Neil Morrissey again, weirdly. Um, oh, he was the best thing in this film. Um, <laughs> You're right, where everyone. He says, Literally everyone. Shit. Neil Morrissey's family played by Neil Morrissey. <laughs> when he describes what Danny Dyer is doing as 100% bigamy. <laughs> That's 100% yeah. big of me. I must have missed that one. That is quite good. Um, when they finally take the picture, the paper, newspaper journalist takes a picture of Danny Dyer and Denise Van Out, and it captures Danny Dyer's face just as it's capsizing, and it's quite a good candid shot of a man in pain. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Le- legs 11. Gone to heaven. There we go. <laughs> but then gone to heaven is probably it's not clear enough, is it? Curtains on rails. Turkish delight. Like you like Christ, that's not even anything. Not even anything. <laughs> I like the bloody imagery of sort of because it's really weird the whole red liquid thing. I don't think it's in the stage show, but it's a really bizarre addition. But there's bits where like Danny Dyer is moving a big bunch of red liquid to the toilet and then ends up throwing it everywhere, so it just looks like a bloody toilet. And it's just a really bizarrely upsetting image for this comedy yeah. film that I appreciated. And he's very bad at tipping it down the toilet. Yeah. He stumbles and just fucking dumps it about seven <laughs> metres from the toilet. Yeah. Reminded me of like a Twin Peaks domestic scene. I liked it. The, the, the liquid needed to start coming solidly out of the toilet again and assimilating with the flat. <laughs> I did like the cut to the policeman when he's helping holding at the ceiling and he's already drenched in water and he's just looking f- thoroughly miserable. <laughs> yeah. Good cut. Good face. Probably the only one in the film when I think about it. <laughs> Yeah. Although Neil Morrissey did sit on a cake. Oh, come <sighs> on. Uh, uh, what is he like? Wait. He sat on a like cake. Rosamund Pike. I think you meant that he cut it up and ate it carefully. No. 
What you? No. Well, he put well, that's him all it. sat you... on it like a chair would. Yeah. Fuck me. And then he went and kissed a man, or so people thought. <laughs> oh, that's not, not mar- right. Not married a woman like you expected. <laughs> <laughs> not married a woman or... and lived happily ever after. Yeah. Or got a job. When when one of the dis- depressing cameos gets knocked into a hedge and somebody goes, "Oh, that was funny." <laughs> um, when he, when he's then pulled from the hedge, he he just goes, "Ow." <laughs> it's good a good out of context noise yeah look i like sarah harney's midriff it was a very 90s midriff i thought and uh <laughs> it was the most effective time setter in the entire movie it, it, like, it let me know it let you the viewer know where you were and what to expect yeah and you know it was a nice midriff fair play <laughs> to sarah harding because she earned that midriff it was the midriff of someone from like one of those dance steps. groups yeah steps it was a steps yeah. midriff the, the threatening, the non-threatening policeman, when he says, "Just a social call, Mister Gardner. Just a social call." He does a lovely little cheeky wink. <laughs> I enjoyed that. I was like, "Oh, look at him doing a facial expression." I'll have one more, which is that there's a weird moment when, um, in both the stage play, it's in the original script and it's in the um, the film, where he comes back and he says, um, "You do just one more thing, uh, Mister Neil Morrissey. You do know what an accessory is, don't you?" And he's like, "What, like an handbag?" Lame joke. But then he says, "Oh, an accessory." Yeah. And he's like, good. And he leaves. I kind of like the way that both he and all of the actors I've seen so far just kind of go, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, there's a, something sort of grim and fatalistic about it. Like, yeah, I know what we're talking about. Last one, when Danny dies on his newspaper stealing rampage and he rips the paper out of someone's hand, probably probably Derek Jacobi for all I know. He's left with one half ripped, half complete page of a newspaper and he kind of looks miffed for a, half a second and then goes and then just starts studying this one shitty bit of newspaper that he's got left just making do <laughs> the british way mate the year of the olympics business as usual people's war <laughs> my last good thing is when it looks like the whole thing has finally fallen apart and this time there's not going to be a way out they're on the terrace and yeah. danny dice looks to neil morrissey as if to say shall i just do it and Neil Morris, he sort of nods and puts a supportive hand on his shoulder, as if to say, yeah, mate, it's the time. And then he doesn't. He tells another lie. And Morris, he sort of looks despaired. But that little moment of just reassurance, of just, it's going to be okay, mate. Let's do this together. Mm. I- I'm here. This is going to be awful. But let's just bloody well do it. Let's put an end to this. Mm. And I-, I like that. And that was all expressed with like just a, a look and a hand. Aww. A little bit of cinema there. God, he of... was the best thing but in the film. Bit... You know what? A little bit of a human moment. Oh, we like those, don't we? Yeah. Werther's Originals, human <laughs> moment. <laughs> like both. Oh, I finally made it, mate. Cotney Rhyming Slam. It's not that hard. <laughs> Slam. Cotney... Welcome to Cotney Rhyming Slam. <laughs> <laughs> I like me bread and butter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Christ. <laughs> uh, the apples and pears. Bigam is good, everyone. It's allowed. Oh, see what you <laughs> Have did there, no but, uh, fears. Fears. See what you did there. Didn't make any sense, though, in the end. <laughs> Whose fault was that, huh? Thatcher. Oh, did the OG team actually uh, <laughs> offer us anything other than scorn? No, no. surprisingly, no one has seen Run For Your Wife. And if they have, what? I suspect that nobody wants to admit to it. Look, this film made £600 at the box office, Paul. That means at least... <laughs> 60 people saw it. <laughs> if it was 60 people they'd have spent 10 quid a ticket yeah that sounds about right 2013 you know what sorry hang on a minute Ted have you seen what was it have you seen Run for Your Wife can you ask Julie I love Julie okay well I just polled 20% of Britain and they haven't seen it uh, so what can you do I guess not <sighs> oh well oh well thanks OG team thanks OG team this movie's awful don't watch it <laughs> one better thing the one better thing I'm going to talk more about this film in the top 10 films of the year because it's undoubtedly going to appear there as well. But I'll tell you why it is that I'm recommending Happy New Year, Colin Bursted, Mm. uh, the new film by Ben Wheatley, who we previously discussed the rest of his filmography um, in various One Good Things, I think, Mm. but in particular detail in the uh, One Good Thing You Might Have Missed, the first one. Um, Originally called Colin New Anus, a sort of, um, what do you call it, uh, homonym? with um, Coriolanus, because Mm. it is in fact a sort of modern retelling of Coriolanus Mm. in the context of a family. Uh, Neil Maskell plays Colin, who has brought his family together on New Year's Eve in order to try and mend various broken bridges. However, Hayley Squires, who plays his sister Jeannie, has invited Sam Riley, who plays David, a brother who has been kind of banished from the family, (laughs) who's now going to come back and uh, cause a lot of trouble. Mm. 
So why am I recommending it here? Because it is a bit of a farce. It's a film with lots of different stories, lots of characters, and a lot of great actors. You've got people like Asim Chowdhury, the comedic um, act performer, mm. Charles Dance, uh, Dune McKeegan, and um, various other people from sort of British comedy shows and history. And they all come together, and they're really funny. It's not over the top. It's not, comp- you know, I think Dune McKeegan is maybe the closest to someone who does a sort of pantomime performance as the awful sort of mum. Mm-hmm. Even she, there's like believability there. You get her and you've known people like her. Yeah. It's all very authentic. It was written by Wheatley without his regular writing partner, Amy Jump, and it feels very well observed. And the thing about it is, whereas Run For Your Wife felt sluggish and boring, Happy New Year, Colin Bursted is fucking relentless. It moves so fast. Mm. It's only 95 minutes long, but sweet Christ, everything is happening all at once. I remember a feeling about 20 minutes in where I just thought, I thought this was the intro, but the whole film is going to be like this. Wow, okay. And it was like a feeling of excitement of just, Jesus, this is not going to slow down until it ends. Because it feels like that opening montage that every film has, where it's just like, quick shot of these guys, shot of these guys, mm. you know, here's what they're, where they're at, here's where they're at, and now they all get together. But it's just... It's brilliant. It's funny. It's exciting. It's moving in places. Mm. And it's got something very sadly profound to say about the whole thing. Um, Wheatley has announced that he's planning on adapting the whole thing to a television show with these characters in it. But frankly, I'm a little worried about that because this is perfect. I shouldn't be worried because Ben Wheatley so far, in my opinion, hasn't put a foot wrong. Mm. But nevertheless, I think Happy New Year Colin Bursted is a masterpiece of his. Um, and I urge you all to see it. Um, and you can do, because it's on iPlayer, for anyone who's in England. Mm. Hopefully after that, because it's due to be on I- iPlayer for a year, they're also looking into some theatrical releases, and hopefully it'll get a DVD release as well. So keep an eye out cool. for it. Yeah, you just sort of don't want him to do a Shane Meadows and just remake it yeah. as a TV show oh, seven no. times. No, you've got to keep going. <laughs> yeah, You've got to keep going, Neil Ma- uh, Ben Wheatley. And Neil Maskell, who's fucking hilarious in everything he does, yeah. but this is his funniest role yet. Um, no, Ben Wheatley, you've got to keep going because we need yeah. we need that all female remake of um, Sorcerer that you said you'd do. <laughs> He's working on an adaptation of Rebecca. Oh. Sound fucking tactic, wow. fantastic! Oh, to be released on Netflix, fantastic! There goes my enthusiasm. <laughs> Watch on a big screen, It'll turn off fun. the lights, and uh, invite one of those drug dealers who live near you to sit in with you and pay <laughs> on their phone. <laughs> I'm literally going to lock my phone in a different room, pretend I'm in a cinema, and that cinema is still alive. What's your one better thing, Paul? So my one better thing was mentioned earlier on in the podcast as an example of successfully translating a play to medium of cinema, and that is Carnage, starring Kate Winslet, Jodie Foster, John C. Reilly, and Christoph Waltz. It's based on mm. a sort of very silly misunderstanding that leads to two sets of parents approaching chaos when they're trapped in a single apartment. Yeah. Tensions are raised. Why this works is, well, for obvious reasons why Run For Your Wife didn't, the directing, cinematography, and editing, but it's, mm. it's very good looking. It's very entertaining. The, the dialogue mostly feels very natural and they also managed to contrive convincing reasons for these people to stay in this apartment and to work with the limitations of the location that was originally in the play and much like colin uanus it's just electric it's just so fast paced from moment to moment there's not there's barely a moment of silence in the film because it's just crazy and yeah. energy coming from these four people it has that awful exterminating angel uh thing to it where everybody's just about to leave but then don't yeah and it's like they're all trapped together and it's horrible the sense of anger of unease when you feel like they're just about to get the fuck out of there and then something else sucks them back into the yeah. flat and it's like oh for god's sake no yeah <laughs> why Please. It's just a really tense situation. But it is really good. And unlike Run For Your Wife, you don't have to feel weird about fucking Rolf Harris showing up and making everything weird. (laughs) Mm. Oh, God. Who directed this? Oh, never mind. (laughs) Anyway, those were The One Better Things. The One Better Thing. Thanks for listening to One Good Thing. Paul, where can the ladies and gentlemen find out how to run for their podcast? Twitter and Facebook, obviously, they've installed a new virtual treadmill, so you can obviously. pretend you're exercising can, as you're scrolling, <laughs> and you don't ever have to leave the house ever again. While you're doing that, you can go <laughs> and find us at OGT Pod, send us messages, suggestions, um, cease and desist letters, and um, long, drunken emails of regret from that one night we spent together in Havana, and you wish it would have gone further, Michael. Fuck yeah. And Look, we all wanted it to go further. We were all a little bit scared. Yeah. Paul and I did. This is why and, we made uh, the podcast. We're reaching out to you. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Let's make this happen. Come on. Again. We'll always have Havana.
Yeah. You can, if, if not, we always will have a, a Gmail address. You can send us an email at otcpod <laughs> at gmail.com. You can like and subscribe on iTunes, write, rate, review, do all the things that spreads the word that gets our faces up close, on at least on the second line of the Google image search when you type in one good thing. Oh, man, I can't wait for that. God, I'm sick of being a four-liner. Yeah. We're actually a five-liner, mate. <laughs> Are we? We're on the fifth line, or we yeah. can just say one good thing, not one good thing podcast. Yeah, just let's no, one good thing with the huh? fifth line. Five liners, mate. <laughs> We're five liners, everyone. <laughs> Come on. Get us up to three. At least. We can overtake Bob Marley. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid that idiot. Prick. Dead idiot. Coming for you. <laughs> well, my toe's been hurting for a while. I haven't <laughs> seen any NHS treatment about it. Oh, hubris. <laughs> We've we've been on a couple of podcasts recently that have been oh yes yeah. that have been made available to the disgusting public against my better judgment. Uh, we're on the the film connection. Stephen Saunders. We're on his podcast. Let's get stuck into discussing Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. But uh, a new one has just been released where we discuss uh, Moscow, Moscow on, on the, the Hudson, Hudson, specifically Robin mm. Williams within yes. that film. Mm. Um, that's the film connection. So check that out. Yep. Also, we are on a new Baby Beard Shut Up and Take My Podcast episode where we discuss underwhelming future arm, future arm episode, Mobius Dick. <laughs> Find out what we really think about it. <laughs> Listen to the episode. <laughs> and I'd also like to extend a warm thank you and hello to Cody Mann, who sent us some lovely praise via the Baby Beard Boys. Ooh, oh, yeah. Yeah, that was great. Praised them and us in a single email. And that's very lovely. Hello to you, Cody. Thanks for listening. And America, how do you work? <laughs> Tell us. All of it. How does every little bit of it work? It's like a really elaborate cucumber, I suspect. It's got two layers. You peel off one, (laughs) and it's just water inside. Bye, everyone. And remember, the one good thing about Danny Dyer's Run For Your Life is that every now and then, every kneel and then, (laughs) you need a good now on your shoulder.